termites. Fire. You're going to set that on fire. I am going to set something on fire eventually. <laughs> it's episode 41. Isn't that exciting, termites? Yes, it's so exciting. I have so many things. To I have no news from the queens to report. Everyone's been extremely quiet. Um, at least nothing I've seen. Um, so the ladies are being quiet. Um, I have a lot of food reporting to do for you guys, though. Bingo on this. Available at Kroger. Publix. Mo this is um, medium. Is this from Buffalo Wild Wings, though? It's, the, it's their version. Yeah. yeah. Medium sauce. This made me laugh. Buffalo with comfortable heat. <laughs> so nice. for all of you old people that go, well, is it a comfortable heat? Who would even say that? This stuff is not that fattening either. Really all in all. Zero, oh, one carb, th total grams of fat, three. Um, and I tasted it with a cracker. And wow. Do you like buffalo wild wings, people? I like their wings. Yeah, me too. But I don't like the environment. Yeah. And I love all the sports screens, but I don't know. The bar stools are cold. The furniture's cold. I don't like the openness of it. It doesn't feel like a cozy sports bar. But, you know, in some towns, that's the only place we can go to watch, well, really, any <laughs> games sometimes. I remember being in Midland, Texas, and thinking, where the hell are we going to watch? I don't know. It was me and Chuck. I don't remember what we wanted to watch. Maybe a basketball. He probably wanted to watch that. Or the die. He probably wanted to watch it. But anyway, I'll give him credit for they They are everywhere. And they do provide the sports. And their their wings are good. And this sauce is fucking great. Well done. <laughs> so if you're looking for a wing sauce. Comfortable heat. Comf it has a com it's a comfortable heat. <laughs> Then I bought this, and I should be saving this for a video, which I will also do. This is the McDonald's crispy chicken sandwich. Now, normally I wouldn't eat these fried things, but while well, these pickles look great. Um, for the podcast and to make other stupid videos, I've been reviewing these. And I'm going to ruin my own video by already taking a bite out of this. But, mm, wow. Good. Did you get spicy or regular? Regular. It's really good. I still say KFC's is better. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't like anything. Like I don't like anything at McDonald's anymore. Even the kids, when I get the kids their happy meals and shit, I don't know, sometimes the cheeseburgers are cold, and you're like, just because they're a kid doesn't mean you can give them cold shit. I mean, they're going <laughs> to... I mean, you can. Yeah, you give them a and they probably don't really notice anyway, but I, have, I just think McDonald's went downhill from when I was a kid. And then they quit the good fries, but we've already talked about that. And they make the bullshit fries. But I'll say this is a good start on the road to the comeback, McDonald's. If I was on the road and starving and yeah. willing to eat the calories in there, God knows I wouldn't even want to look. But anyway, I'll give them credit. You don't sound real excited about it. It's great. Okay. It really is. I just think KFC's is better. You know, stay in your lane. <laughs> yeah. What's your sign say? The old one used to say McDonald's hamburgers. Mm -hmm. Over 20 bazillion sold or whatever sure. number they threw out there. Like any of us can prove differently. But I did like McDonald's back in the day. I've never had a Big Mac in my life. I've had, I, don't, I won't eat anything that says secret sauce in it. Because that could ruin it. So I don't do that. Um, and I don't know. I just never needed more than a cheeseburger. This what I'm about to taste is probably going to make me vomit in my own mouth, but I'm doing it for the children. And when I say for the children, I am imitating Michael Jackson. And no matter what he said in that Martin Bashir interview, he just kept going, but the children. So this is for the children. It's Twinkies lemonade stand flavor. And then it says golden sponge cake filled with creamy sponge filling, lemon creamy. Um, Delicious. Um, no. no. Wow. You know who was like this? My dad. He likes anything lemon. I'm not a lemon person. And I don't think a lot of kids are. Maybe these were just made for Jack Madigan. Is One that, home. Is that Alex's lemonade stand? What? Alex's lemonade stand. Who's Alex? The kid that had cancer a long time ago. Alex's lemonade stand? The kid who had... No, it says Twinkie the Kid. Look on the bottom. You're... Don't I, the proceeds go to something? Proceeds go to... 
I think you made up a whole campaign in your mind, Paddles. Well, I'm going to vote for it. I'm going to say it. That goes There's nothing on yeah. here about Alex or cancer or a fun. You completely fucking made that scenario up. It's Twinkie the Kid at a lemonade stand. Whoa. These are good. It says till June 11th, 2021. You know that means 2051. Right. Twinkies. Every once in a while, my mom will pull shit out of her golf bag. Because I'll be like, do you have anything? I'm starving. She'll go, let me look. And then she digs around <laughs> and pulls out crackers that are like 17 years old. But they're fine. And then you go, what are we really eating? And then I go, who gives a shit? We're on the eighth hole and there's, no, there's nothing at the turn. So eat it. <laughs> Fire. Mm -hmm. Oh. What's going on with your Nothing. I was getting, Ron is here. And he's waiting on me to be, quite frankly, finished with this so he can lay on the couch and watch golf. And <laughs> he promises he won't bother me and he promises he'll be quiet, but I told him, no, not till I'm done with this. You cannot come over here. Mustard's here. The dog, his dog is here. I should, maybe I'll get, you wanna see him? You guys wanna, well, only the YouTube people can see him. Well, he looks so comfortable. Here, I'll grab him. No, leave okay. him there. We'll no, he's him. too comfortable. We'll get him at the end. He's a French bulldog. Ron loves him. Um, I would probably go for a beagle instead. Something it's like Ron though. It you know, it sleeps a lot. <laughs> it's a a lounger. It's a lounger. Fun. It's fun. He's fun. Yeah. Ron's fun, yeah. the dog's fun. When he's fun, he's fun. Yeah. Put it that way. Yeah. Okay. And when he's lounging, he's, he's lounging. lounging. Yeah. Okay, Tarmites update. <laughs> Somebody made a really cute meme about update and now I can't find it on my Twitter feed. I lost it. But I'll find it again. And I'm gonna throw that out there a lot. It was very cute. Um Okay, I told you about that old lady in Tokyo. The world's oldest person, not just a regular old lady that was gonna carry the Olympic torch. We all remember that? Yeah. If the Olympics still happen in Tokyo, now there's in there, that's up in the air. The world's oldest person, and here's her picture. She's 118 years old. What? I mean, what? Wow. Yeah. yeah and she good. looks fine in this picture. I mean, she looks fine. The world's oldest person is backed out of the Olympic torch relay in Japan after a small Cluster of cases was linked back to the event. At 118 years and 123 days, Kane Tanaka is the third <laughs> oldest person ever to uh, confirm to have existed in the history of the world. Oh, Holy wow. shit. Well, my friend Louis Black, his mom is 102. And when John McCain's funeral was on, I told him, I go, turn on the TV, Lou. I said, do you see the lady in the front row in a cute little St. John knit number? That's his mother. She's 107, and Lou goes, no, 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 that can't happen, that can't happen, this can't go on this long. And I'm like, yes, it can. And it clearly, is. it can go on to 118. She was due to take part in the Olympic torch relay, but has decided to be too risky after eight coronavirus cases were reported um, uh, among other relay participants. According to Sky News, an official, Olympic official said we received an email from her family which said she wanted to withdraw from the relay as she and her family were concerned about spreading the virus at the nursing home. Aw, isn't that nice? Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice, you know, there have been so many just flat out selfish jackass pricks pricks about, about the, all of it. You know, the, the government's lying and the mask is bullshit, all of it. Um, <laughs> by the way, there's a video of Ricky Schroeder going ape shit at a Costco and screaming, just yelling at the employees who are just doing their job. I don't know how these employees, the Times person of the year next year should be anybody who had to work at a store this year. And that means all of them. Grocery stores, from grocery stores to restaurants, to restaurants included. People, like nobody at Costco, working at Costco has the power to change the mask law. So when you, Ricky Schroeder, show up, who also posted bail for Kyle Rittenhouse, just in case you're wondering what Ricky's up to, after in 2019 being charged with punching his wife, that's where Ricky Schroeder, yeah, and you know what, once again, you don't see that shit with my childhood idol, Sean Cassidy. Nope. No. Nope. He has gone on to have a successful directing and producer career, just as one would have thought, Sean might. <laughs> Ricky Schroeder. Ricky is not. To my old friend Scott Kennedy, gay guy, and Ricky was all over his locker. Look what happened to yours, Scott. Here's your idol. Punched at his wife. And then he's at Costco. It's on Twitter. You can just put in the video. And just, there's two employees, and they're like, look, dude. This is just the law. We just work here. And he's just, do you, do you think, is this what the kings have told you to do? Are you worried about, you know? Look, it's come down to the fact that I'm working at Costco 
which could be good or bad. I don't know. I've never worked at Costco. But you know it's probably not the career that was intended, shall we say? Sit down, NYPD Blue. And you know what? <laughs> you just shot the fuck. Who could be that angry to go, you know what? I'm going to go without my mask on down to Costco and give, give employees who can't change the rule anyway, just give them a bunch of shit and get it all on camera. Like the levels of anger. Christ, I'd, I'd wear a mask wherever as long as I could get in and not have any bullshit. Anyway. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. No. Who cares? Well, the great part is I haven't had to wear makeup in forever. Yeah. Because it's just going to ruin lipstick. Yeah. And then if you have any kind of foundation on here, it's just going to... Yeah. yeah. It's like you were sucking out of a pain can. Yeah. There's no... Uh, I, I don't have a problem. Anyway, according to Sky News and Olivia, they received the email. The Tokyo Olympics is start to do, is due to start on July 23rd, but a surge of uh, coronavirus cases in the, country's, in the country has cast doubt on whether it will go ahead as planned. Reuters reported Wednesday that the Japanese government is mulling an extension to the current state of emergency in Tokyo. Oh, hmm. Well, either which way, our 118-year-old is, is not doing it. Because she's concerned about the younger folks in her nursing home. Wow, there you go. And by younger folks, that would mean everyone on earth right. for her. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Update! Oh, my God. All right. We're going to do a few crypto things. Yeah. 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 It's not hard. Not hard. Some, sometimes you say it's hard. No. Paddles. No. So I Elon Musk. Did you guys see him on Saturday Night Live? Um, I, I give him credit for doing it. Um, I'm still mad at him about his deal with his employees out in California, but that's a different matter. But as far as just Saturday Night Live goes, whoever wrote the monologue, though, I mean, or not whoever, whomever, yeah. there was probably a group. It was, oh, just cringeworthy. Like, he's not funny. It's your job to make him funny and to write funny things. And it just... As it was happening live, and, the, and I'm reading live Twitter, and I'm re watching it and reading it, going, is this just me? No. And then there was, there was a couple funny things on Saturday Night Live this, that past week, and I hardly ever watch it because I'm usually working, but I wasn't. And, um, you know, he gave it, a, and he p participated in all the skits. Some were super stupid. Yeah. Some were funny, mm -hmm. um, which is yeah. usually the case anyway. They all can't be winners. But the, the, the actual monologue was just brutal and then they did like one of those news updating things where they try to understand what dogecoin is and then the guy goes to elon you know so basically it's a hustle and then and elon goes it's a hustle and then that's the end of the skit yeah but they don't really mm -hmm. kate mckinnon saved all of them kate mckinnon saves everything on yeah. that show <laughs> yes, usually yes. <laughs> if there there's one person they should be happy to have it's kate and the you know anyway so Elon kind of trashed, kind of trashed crypto, but then didn't. But anyway, here, here's the result. Elon Musk's net worth has plunged nearly $20 billion since he appeared as the host of SNL last week. But it's not because he got some pretty bad reviews for his performance. They were all bad. I, except I give him credit for participating in the sketches. Because if you're not comfortable with that, no. that's very strange. Like people... My mom wouldn't do it for $20 million. No. She would not do it. Hmm. She doesn't like being on camera. She doesn't like that kind of stuff. Um, according, I. nope, Paddles wouldn't do it. Nope. Never, ever, ever. No. Nope. According to Forbes, which reported Musk has dropped in wealth Thursday, it's a combination of his two big financial interests, cryptocurrency like Dogecoin or Bitcoin. He has a lot in both, remember that. And Tesla stock, losing value that is driving down his overall net worth. It's because he said that Tesla will no longer accept Bitcoin because he, he doesn't agree. I'm surprised he just found out how much energy it takes to mine Bitcoin versus it does not take that to mine the, what I like to call the doggy coin. And right. I can't get anybody on board with my thing, my doggy coin. Well, Nobody, I, like I, bought, um, I bought some. They're like Dogecoin because they they're dishy and they like to say dish. dish. It's a fun word to say. Um, speaking of getting on board, this is just a side note. Yes. Uh, there's at my lake bar. Um, there's this Canadian guy, and he was trying to get everybody on board at the bar because he's really mad at Justin Trudeau for the way this pandemic has been handled. And he was trying to get everybody on board with, to hate Justin Trudeau. 
<laughs> and I thought to myself, dude, you're right. assuming anybody at this bar knows who that is. Right. Let's just start. And if they heard of them, they're not sure why. Right. We, again, are in a bar with a stuffed squirrel holding a banjo. People don't know. They know Trump. You bet your ass they know Trump, but they don't. And he kept going, you know, and here's another thing about Justin. And I'm like, dude, I hear you. I read, well, I used to read the Canadian Huffington Post, too, just to see what's going on. But um, it was just a, such an odd man out. It's almost it, That almost was an SNL skit by itself, like trying to get a lake bar, you know, flip-flops mm -hmm. and T-shirt crowd on board with some po political, th international <laughs> politics. I'm like, dude, how about you just get a little closer to home? How about the governor? Right. Can you get on board with the governor or not on board with the governor? Um, uh, his net worth for the record, Elon is 145 billion. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. So I'm sure if, if, if that'd be like me losing 20 bucks. I don't care. He's lost his 20 billion. Losing 20 billion is nothing. Um, his Tesla shares were down. Bitcoin prices slumped, but they're fine again. I, I check it every day. The Dogecoin is up too. But he joked that it was a hustle, yeah. And his mother was on, too, which was extremely strange. Like, I feel like he's a space person. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think he's an actual alien, but he seems, he says he's asperger -y. And And for whatever whatever I say from here on out, I have a nephew who's autistic, so don't jump any shit. shit. I don't want to hear any shit about it. <laughs> no emails about it. But the spectrum -y people can sometimes seem... Spectrum-y? spectrum, -y. spectrum -y. A little robotic, wow. you know, but his mother was on. And she seemed, I don't know if it was the accent, the South African accent, um, but she seemed kind of the same. Yeah. So maybe, or maybe there are aliens. Maybe people are right. <laughs> aliens. People think that. <laughs> they think he's from the future. Wow. I'm not making that up. Dogecoin's massive red, this is a different article. Um, Dogecoin is a little bit of the middle finger to the system because it's totally made up. It's completely made up. And then when I try to explain this to my old guy friends at the lake bar, they're like, but what is it? And we have to go through that like hundred times. I'm like, we just all agreed to pool our money. Right. It's basically a Ponzi scheme, but you're voluntarily getting in and you can voluntarily get out. It's not like Bernie made up where you didn't know that you thought you were investing in real things that he wasn't investing in at all. He was stealing it. But it's a, you know, it's a coin with a dog on it. Right. Do you get the coin? No, you never, you should though. I think, I think if you invest over $500, or five hundred dollars, maybe a hundred, a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. You should get a one coin delivered to your house in a box, yeah, and it should cool. be a special box. Yeah, yeah, a velvet a box, velvet box velvet that box. when you open it, your your a your Doge coin with your Shiba Inu, whatever. I'm sure I'm saying, <laughs> saying that wrong too. Shiba. You know that dog. The uh, the price of Do uh, Dogecoin surged early Wednesday. The crypto started as a joke in 2013. has been approaching 70 cents per token. Right now, it's about 50. Before giving up some of his later gains on Wednesday to trade around 60 cents apiece. It remains up 13,000 year to date with a market cap of r roughly 78 billion. When you think about the whole spirit of what this crypto revolution is, there's something pure in what Dogecoin has done. Uh, Novogratz, founder and CEO of Galaxal Digity Digital, set on Squawk Box. That's that show on CNBC. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a middle finger to the system. People aren't happy with the current financial system. They just are. No, no. No, not. I don't even understand our system. Mm -hmm. No. Nope. I don't know what our financial system is. I have no idea. I just wanted, I thought it'd be fun to throw a hundred bucks in the pot mm -hmm. and know that I have a doggy coin. Doge coin. He repeated his concern about the sustainability of Dogecoin's rise, believing it lacks the same sophistication as Bitcoin. Of course it does. It's made up. Yeah. It's a fake coin. But I'd like one to, at least if I lose all my money, to know that I did it. It's a total gamble, which is the world's largest cryptocurrency by market value, Bitcoin, he means. But the billionaire investor also said of Dogecoin, it would be a very dangerous it would be very dangerous to be short. I'll tell you that much. I'm not participating on the long side. I think it's dangerous because once that enthusiasm dies, if it dies, you could have a long way down. I don't want to discredit it. It's shocking that the gaming frenzy in GameStop and so other memes stocks took off. Anyway, I won't go any go into it because it's it, unless you want people want to read it. Um, show notes, paddles, but the article is really good. But I also know that. 
A lot of people don't give a shit. Don't care. <laughs> don't care. About, I know. This is why I have the podcast, the podcast, podcast. Because people don't at the bar don't want to listen to my stuff sometimes about certain subjects. So then I put them on here because I think I'll find the nerds that also like the subjects I pick up. Fun and hard things. Fun and hard. Yeah, fun and hard. Well, but we try to make the hard easy here. Yeah, we do. Update. Except for cannabis. The NFL gets a taste of crypto <laughs> as Grayscale partners, Grayscale partners with the New York Giants. So here's, I will not even read the whole article. I'm just saying the New York Giants have hired Grayscale and they're a crypto investment firm to mm -hmm. work with them. Because why the young football players, they want to get paid in crypto. Mm -hmm. They want to invest in crypto, crypto. And so boom, the New York Giants, if they're as bad, well, were they bad last year? The Giants with yeah. Daniel Jones. I like him. I do too, but no. Nope. Speaking of the NFL, before I go to one more update, this is this just chap. I don't know why this chaps my ass. <laughs> I do know why. Yeah, you do. Tim Tebow. I don't ever talk about sports on here. Oh, no. I really try not to because I know there's a lot of people that don't care about sports or know about sports, and it's not a sports podcast. And Especially the sports I like, like golf. Nobody cares under them. Oh, I have to have, I'd have I to have. Golf. Yes, paddles, but most people don't. It's not, you know, it's not football. No, put it that way. It's not football. But a lot of people don't know. So you don't even have to know anything about what, about football to understand what I'm going to say. If I'm going to talk about it, it has to be something very broad. Mm -hmm. Tim Tebow <laughs> is a man who was a really good college quarterback. Mm -hmm. He is also a, a non-stop Christian chatterbox yep. about Jesus, Jesus and and I mean to the point where it, it's on his the, uh, what do they call that shit they put under their eyes? The reflective, the reflective yeah. it tape. It's not tape. It's like John that, 316. And he has John's 316 cuz then he then he'll say, "Well, I don't really I always want to talk about my religion. It's on your face." You started it. That's how I'm going to approach that. You started it. And I prefer um, football and, um, I don't know, sports in general. I just want to think about football. But whatever. Fine. Go ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. he, but he's a super Christian. Like, there's other Christian players that I know because they have those prayer circle things and you see people go in them. Whatever. Fine and dandy. Whatever floats your boat. But he doesn't stop talking about in his career how he prays to the Lord no. about his career. I've heard him say it a million times. And his life. And Well, in his life. Yeah. And then he gives lectures and speeches, and you can hire him out for Christian Day at your yeah. picnic or whatever. Christian Day. <laughs> Come on. That's funny, right? Uh, okay. That's funny right there. And I'm not even saying he seems like a nice enough guy, mm -hmm. but uh, he tried to be an NFL player. He tried to be a quarterback in the NFL. And for those of you who know football, you remember all this. For those of you who don't, trust me. He made the rounds over and over, and it was a failure. He was one of those college guys that just, and you can blame it on A, B, or C, or D, but he was he's no longer playing, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. He did not succeed. So then he decided he was going to go play baseball. So he goes to the Mets. And for four years, he did their spring training, and he did not succeed there either so now now he's 33 years old mm -hmm. same age as when jesus died well maybe Just that's thrown. why he wants to play football maybe this is last call <laughs> now he wants to play tight end which is a different position if you don't understand football not quarterback for the jacksonville uh, jaguars because the new coach there coached him in college and uh it's Florida, so he'd be popular. But how many times? You're 33 years old. This is where the Christianity, like in Catholic school, I don't remember how they really described. Like if you said a prayer and you didn't get the answer you wanted, you were supposed to accept that right. as God's will. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't understand why we were praying anyway. Because if he's going to do what he does, as my <laughs> niece would say, do what you do, what you do, what you do. If, 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 if the Lord, God, is just going to do what he does anyway, I don't even understand why I'm praying. Right. 
I understand I'm supposed to worship him. I got that part down. But the praying for a request, yeah. and then I was explained later to me, as, I don't know, probably in eight, you know, eighth grade, oh, no, you're not praying for a result. You're praying for your ability to handle the result. Wow, yeah. 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 Deeper. That's a pivot. But here's all I got to say. Tim Tebow has been talking with the Lord <laughs> for a decade now a to become a professional sports person of any sport, anywhere. And at this point, I firmly believe that the Lord has Tebow's prayers marked as spam. <laughs> How much are you going to bother the Lord? Yeah. When do you accept? Yeah. When do you accept? If every day I said a prayer for, you know, the, oh man, I really hope it gets, and it never happens. Sometimes you just, then you have to go to Julie Andrews who's my second favorite person oh for spiritual God. advice, and say, sometimes when the Lord opens a, closes a window, he opens a door. And then, then, I am 16, going on 17. Um, and then these guys, all these guys, these coaches, I won't go into reading all this. He's going to sign a one-year contract with it. And they'll sell tickets. And then Paddles had a good point that, if he fails as a if if Trevor Lawrence, this is too much for non-sports people, but Jacksonville has a new quarterback who is very good at in college. If he fails, then they can use Tebow as a, he's a free quarterback, in other words, in the position of tight end. But the other thing that pisses me off, and it pisses me off about spring training, they hire Tebow because he'll sell fucking tickets. But yeah. you know what? There's some other kid who has worked his ass off since he's been like eight or younger, mm -hmm. five, yeah. to get that spot at Mets spring training, and he doesn't get it. Right. He, you're taking up a spot. It'd be like me going to open mic night every Monday and just doing a half hour. Mm -hmm. And there are people that drove to be on open mic night, and they're hoping right. to get on the list. And I'm just going to go in there and, you know, because they would let me if I wanted to, and, you know, oh, sure, Kathleen, you do whatever you want. And I've seen what I call the asshole comics do that. I would never do that. And it's not that I'm morally superior. It's just the right thing, the nice thing to do. You don't, he just keeps taking up spots and he doesn't give a shit. So somebody might be able to get to be a tight end for Jacksonville Jaguars. That's not going to happen now. Nope. Cause, pfft. okay, I just, that wasn't even that funny, <laughs> but boy, I've been waiting to say it. I just, he has, he, he has, I don't respect people who can't accept a result, whatever the result is. I remember one time I was on a Bob Hope special. That's how old I am. I was horrible. Well, I don't know. I don't think I was horrible. Wow. No. Well, my jokes were fine. It's just the wrong audience. And they were super duper old. Like they came from nursing homes. It was me, Wendy Lehman, Margaret Show, and then I don't remember the other two women. Um, but like I knew that wasn't a good. It didn't look that way on TV. Thankfully, somehow they saved it. But. I don't know. I just, you just accept it. You just, okay, well, I better get better for the next one. I better find out what the audience is. That was my fault. Why didn't I ask? Crystal Who's Bernard. Huh? Crystal Bernard. Crystal Bernard was not a stand-up, though. She was just a host. And Phyllis Diller. Phyllis Diller did not do stand-up. She just hosted, but she was fun. Rue McClanahan. Yeah, these are wow, the... you know Golden Girl? I do know. Wow. Well, I don't really know Rue McClanahan, but I was on a show with her. Fantastic. I don't even know if she's still alive. Anita Wise. Anita Wise was a stand-up, yep. Okay. Um, that her. There's and one other lady. Hang on. It's not, it's not in there. It's not in there. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was only four of us. 1992. Maybe I made that up. Mm -hmm. 1992. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, uh, moving on. I just think if you try and try and try, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to move on. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I feel like my brother had golfing friends like that. Because my youngest brother went to college on a golf scholarship. And I said, what's the difference between you and the guys who make it? And he said, about six feet, Kathleen. Six feet on the green, six feet off the tee, six feet, six feet everywhere. They're closer than I am, and they're getting birdies, and I'm trying to save the par. Even though he's really good. Like, I didn't see any difference between Patrick, honestly, and somebody on TV as far as the way he could golf in college. But he goes, you just have to accept you're not going to be one of those guys. And then he had a few friends that did not accept that. And then they go on to this. And then that's the whole bullshit myth of America. Just keep trying no matter what. No. <laughs> Look around. Time's up. Look around. Like, well, Patrick had one friend. 
I'm certainly not going to mention any names, but this guy was not going to give up. And I said, you know, if you're going to be on the PGA, shouldn't you have won a tournament in Missouri? I mean, like, aren't these just things that are clear? But that's a problem with golf, too. Not clear. It's not, it is clear. It's not crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the whole never give up on your dreams, bullshit. Mm -hmm. You're in the wrong dream sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought I would be a comedian. I had all kinds of other dreams. Well, not many. Who's kidding who? <laughs> um, I don't know. I always thought, well, I'm really sure it'd be fun to be a jockey. Right. And I went to the track all the time. But, you know, you do what you do. Do what you do. Update! This is the last one. <laughs> and I know this is another subject only the super nerds are still interested in. This is, a, this is new information, though, as May 5th, 2021. Written by Jamie Johnson, not the Jamie Johnson country singer who's my friend who I golf with sometimes. Not that Jamie Johnson, a different Jamie Johnson. Uh, depressed Malaysian pilot of Flight 370, the one I'm obsessed with, made a series of deliberate turns and speed changes to avoid radar detection. This is new. This is now, I mean, I thought this, but I didn't, I've never seen, I didn't do the work. Aerospace engineer Richard Godfrey who has spent years investigating the flight's 2014 disappearance, said his, his research suggested that the pilot, Zahir Ahmad Shah, took a carefully planned fight, flight path to avoid giving a clear idea of where he was heading. The Boeing 777 with 239 people aboard dropped off radar screens. We know all this. The plane took an unexpected U-turn from its planned flight path and headed back across the Malay Peninsula and the Malacca Strait before vanishing. He said, Godfrey, the plane's final movements could be mapped out using data from a weak signal propagation, from weak signal propagation, a global network of radio signals that can trace the movement of planes as they cross signals and set off invisible electronic tripwires. WSPR is like a bunch of tripwires or laser beams, but they work in every direction over the horizon to the other side of the globe, Mr. Godfrey said. His research found that MH, uh, MH370 crossed eight of these tripwires as it flew over the Indian Ocean, which is consistent with the previous studies of the plane flight path. He said the plane's change in movements and speed appeared to suggest it was trying to avoid leaving clues as where it was heading. The flight path appears to be carefully planned. And that guy, this is the guy that had the massive simulator in his house. Yeah. And then my friend who's a pilot said, well, it wouldn't be that weird to have one of those. I said, well, well maybe. the one he had was like Star Trek. It right. looked like the whole, yeah. And wasn't just like a th like a tiny one. The level of detail and planning implies that a mindset will want to see this complex, um, this complex plan properly executed executed through to the end. Friends of the pilot said he was lonely and sad. While aviation specialist William Langschweich wrote in the Atlantic, "There's a strong suspicion among investigators in the aviation world that this is the case." So, you know. There you go. We don't, still don't have any proof, but yep. but that's that's what I believe. I do I do think he did it um, on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Poor Those people. poor people. What an asshole, though. You know, if you want to take yourself down, that's fine, I guess. I mean, you're playing all by yourself. But 239 people, you're yeah. just going to murder them? In a big plane. In a big plane. Yeah. And they're probably asleep when you do it. Yeah. And then they wake up terrified. Yeah. That's like... That's a super, yeah. Say it. Mm -hmm. Say it. Do it. Wrong ocean. I love it. Wrong ocean! <laughs> <laughs> there, I said it. Yeah. Okay, what are we watching, termites? First of all, are you guys, re are you watching The Godfather of Harlem? I don't know. I don't know that we talked about that before because season one might have already been completed by the time I started doing these uh, podcasts. But... It is so good, and Forrest Whitaker playing Bumpy Johnson. If you don't know what it is, it's it, it, it's about the um, the Italians go up against um, the black people in Harlem to get control of the drug trade, and in the sixties, seventies, the whole show is so awesome. And season two has started, and it's just as good as ever. And Vincent D'Onofre, who I did not like in Law and Order. If you don't know who he is, it's the, he was in the newer Law & Orders because I felt like his cadence was on purpose yeah. to be on weird. It's a 
it's annoying. Uh, it's super it annoying. was an affectation, yeah. But in this, most of the time I like him. Okay. He does play a pretty good mob guy, like a low rung mob guy, and he's convincing as like the thuggy, mm -hmm. he seems like the thuggy Jersey guy that's in Harlem at the time. But yeah. anyway, highly recommend it if you like any of the things I just talk about, talked about, and I don't remember what it's on, but you can find it. I can't, I, look at, see, Paddles loves you. I would have told you said, you guys can fucking Funny, do it yourselves. Yeah. Right? Amazon. But here's the other one on HBO. I think it's on HBO Max, right? Did I get that right? The Mayor of Easttown. Oh, yeah. Oh. First of all, Saturday Night Live did the funniest skit. That sketch was so great. If you have... It, Kate Winslet play, plays a detective in somewhere Pennsylvania. And what's crazy is I've worked all those towns, all of them. I've worked Harrisburg, York, Allentown, Pittsburgh, but the ones in the middle, because they all have a theater, like a 1500 seater, and those people like to stay where they're at. So if I go to them, they'll come out, and it's great. Um, but the accent, and I have a sister-in-law, my sister-in-law is from Philly, and First being around all of that. Well, a hundred years ago, I worked at the Philadelphia Funny Bone, which was down on, uh, I think, 6th Street, somewhere yeah. downtown. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I never heard that accent in person. <laughs> and boy, when it's waitresses at a comedy club that are not in a good mood, that accent comes out even stronger. Yeah. yeah. Get out of the way. I hate you. What's the you. With you. It's, a, it's the O's. <laughs> I need more water. <laughs> Give me water, water, like it comes out. Water. And it takes a, it's hard to mimic. It's so specific. Baltimore's is also super specific that I could never do. Um, Lou sometimes can do it, but then he falls out of it. And yeah, <laughs> Lou's not an accent guy, and he's not a mimic. Mimicking, I would put myself in a pretty good, I'd give myself a B plus a mimic, but it takes an A to mimic that accent and Kate Winslet who you do forget she's British and I've always thought her accents were great mm -hmm. Nicole Kidman's I don't agree with because Nicole Kidman I love her I think she's a great actress actor whatever I was supposed to say but occasionally I hear South I hear Australia nice. Nicole doesn't keep it going pretty good though for her she'll say a word where it's like stencil <laughs> and it's an I instead of, instead of stencil Stencil, and I know I have an accent, so I'm not really making fun of people. But if you're an actor and you're gonna try this, whoa, and you're gonna, I can only, I wanna hear from anybody from Pennsylvania that has seen this on YouTube comments. What do you guys, do you give her an A? Remember, she's British, so it's harder, right? B, but this is what she had to do to um, do the accent. Yo, I can do it sometimes, like, we're going to go down to the house. Get a, house. Get a it's the, oh, get a hoagie. <laughs> yeah. But I'm sure people in Pennsylvania would be like, that's wrong. <laughs> Fuck you. Barely 11 minutes into the first episode of Mayor of East Town. It's just a made up place. Kate Winslet goes where few actors have gone before. She says the word water, as in the good people of Southeastern, as in what the good people of Southeastern Pennsylvania call the stuff that comes out of the faucet. Water. <laughs> W O O D E R. Winslet has never been timid about about much as a performer, especially the accent. She played a German concentration camp guard in The Reader. I never saw it. A Brooklyn waitress in The Wonder Wheel. Never saw that either. And a multilingual Armenian Polish composer, executive in Steve Jobs. Oh, I did oh, see yeah. that. Yeah, I didn't even know it was her till like the hat till the movie was probably yes. three fours over. Yeah. Wow. But few sounds are as difficult to master as uh, rounded O's, erratic A's, drop consonants, and smooshed syllables of the Philadelphia accent. Uh, the HBO limited series uh, wins this stars as Mayor Sheehan, a detective investigating the murder of blah, blah, blah. I don't need to go into it all. Mayor of vape sucking, rolling rock, swilling <laughs> former high school basketball star and middle aged grandmother fits writing linguistically. And then they go into all of it. Um, but she said, it's the top two hardest dialects I've ever done. Um, she points to the features like the obviously tricky O formed closer to the front of the mouth so that home sounds like home. The way people from Delacote kind of smoosh words together so words like wouldn't and couldn't come out wouldn't, cut in. Cut in. 
Kaan. I can't go. Can another ve- go. It's hard. It's hard to do a whole sentence of it. Another vexing quirk is a short a, which varies dramatically depending on the consonant before it. So sad is just sad, but mad is closer to mad. 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 M e e y a d. And a throwaway like really line like really bad crap comes a linguistic minefield. <laughs> I would just follow. I would just uh, hire like 10 Philly people and lived with them for a week. Yeah, yeah. If you're a mimic, you get it. Yeah. But you'd probably forget it as soon as they left. Yeah. The thing about doing a dialect is making it just disappear so that it's not like a voice you, that you hear the actor doing. It just evaporates. It's something that I have to work on truly every day. So I won't go into it. But if you guys, uh, the article's long and boring. I read it. Trust me, I got you guys. I got you. I got, I, I'm your editor. I can edit all this bullshit down too. It's fun to watch her do it. And if you know anybody from that area, it's twice as fun because she's doing them in front of your face. Okay, that's what we're watching. Godfather of Harlem, Mayor of Easttown. Mm-hmm. You guys ready for this? The Roman Coliseum in Rome is gonna get a $22 million new floor to give tourists a gladiator view. Nice. I don't know if I've told a story about taking well, if you go and watch my Comedy Central thing, I don't even, what is that, what was that show called? This is not happening. This is not happening. Mm-hmm. I don't even remember. We'll put it in the show. Notes. I'm on shows and I don't even know what they're called. I remember, <laughs> I remember one time for um, biography, these people called me and said, um, would you be willing to participate in the Jeff Foxworthy biography show? And I, I literally thought, did he die? I mean, I know him. No, someone would have told me, right. his wife or somebody. And they go, oh, we're not doing it like that anymore. Because I thought it was mostly for dead people. Biography things, right? Well, they're doing lo- like living ones now where the person's still alive and they take them around. And um, I'm sitting there with Ron White and Larry the Cable Guy at a table. <laughs> and first of all, I said to Larry, dude, there's, um, there's a stain on your shirt. I don't know if you care. I don't. And I tr- he goes... <laughs> He goes, Kathleen, I doubt you're going to find any middle-aged fat man without a stain on his shirt. <laughs> I said, well, you're probably right. I just want to let you know because we're on TV. And Ron goes, is this even on a channel? I'm like, yeah, you guys. It's like, holy shit. Did- I've gone into shit blind because I had to for a favor. or, But normally, I have some idea. Of what? <laughs> but clearly, Comedy Central, I couldn't remember the name of the show. But anyway, I took me and my sister, took my mom, and it was supposed to be my sister in law, and she bailed. So then my mom, without asking us, asked the neighbor, who was, I don't even know at the time, 78, something like that. Good times. She was a very nice lady. But you know, now it's instead of it's three of us taking care of one 75 year old, it's two of us taking care of two. Yeah. It kind of flipped the ratio there. Not taken care of, but, you know, hop to it, get on the train. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll check us in. I got it. Um, so we went to Rome, too. The story on Comedy Central is about a purse thing in, uh, well, we got in trouble with the law because of some <laughs> Chinese con people that we got involved with by accident. Anyway, it's a very long story. It's all true. But we also went to Rome on that trip, and I didn't talk about that on the show because nothing crazy happened. But my sister, I said, I want to go to the Coliseum. It was all to go to the Vatican Mm because my mom wanted to go to the Vatican. Before she died, and my dad said he didn't care, so he stayed home and went fishing. He didn't give a (laughs) shit. But uh, he cares about, like, other kinds of trips, but, like, Ireland or golf, but not this. And uh, I said, well... Before we go to the Vatican, I want to go over to the Coliseum. And my sister goes, do you know they didn't even have gladiator things there? And I said, what? I think, I think you're mistaken. She goes, no, it's true. Me and Holly and Kim looked it all up. And like they did have gladiator things in Italy, but never there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I said... <laughs> Because she goes, I don't want to go. And I go, where do you want to go? She goes, it's just a bunch of rocks. I go, now we're getting to the truth. You just don't want to go. Right. Now you're making shit up so I won't go. Right. And I don't believe that. I think they did have gladiator things there. And they did. 
And she wasn't lying. She just believed that. And she goes, I just want to go sit by the fountains and shop. I said, well, we can go sit, quote, sit by a fountain after we go to the Coliseum. I want, I'm, I've only been to Rome once in my life, that time. Right. <sighs> Tell you, teaches you which siblings to vacation with. My best match, my brother. Like if I had to take a sibling. Um, here you go. For 500 years, the Coliseum was the biggest amphitheater in the, in the Roman Empire, hosting gladiator fights. Are you listening, Kate? executions and animal hunts the, oh and then she goes you know what's over there now you might like this cats lots of cats and i said yeah i would like that and there are there's like shitloads of wild cats in there or at least there were 10 years ago when we went now nearly 2000 years after it's built the coliseum's getting a new high-tech floor made of carbon fiber covered in sustainable wood it it promises to visit to give visitors a gladiator's view of italy's most popular tourist one of the most popular tourist attractions at the moment the coliseum underground system of tunnels is exposed and you they show you all this a remnant of the 19th century archaeologists who unearthed the labyrinth of corridors that lay below the arena it's awesome i don't even know that they should do this but maybe the floor will be retractable through electrical mechanisms okay maybe then because then you won't mess up what's already down there, which, is, yeah, it's kind of, as my sister would say, like a lot of rocks. Yeah, it <laughs> is. It's a lot of rocks. Okay. That's what she thought it said about old Rome, too. It's stupid. Everything fell down. I know it fell down. Uh -huh. That's why it's not the new Rome. It's the old Rome. <sighs> the fights I had in that vacation just to go see something. I go, the next thing you know, you're going to tell me the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre. She goes, no, it is. That's true. Okay, I won one battle. Uh, the, the Coliseum, which could host up to 70,000 people when it opened, drew up about 7.6 million visitors in 2019 before the coronavirus thing. When it was built in AD 80, the floor was made of wood and covered with sand. It was high tech for its time with moving parts and removable sections where gladiators and wild animals would pop up on a stage through a complex system of elevators. I thought that was mind blowing. Yeah. In the year 80, because they were showing us, and this is another thing, because I think my sister said they didn't even have like lions over there. And I go, <laughs> I think they did. I don't know what you and Holly and Kim and Mary Kay <laughs> read or heard, but this time I'm not saying I'm a know it all. I just think you're wrong. Do you have any like, ranch? Do you have any ranch? <laughs> it's not even one of their kids, but it's somebody that ages kids. Do you have any ranch? To see what they could do in the year 80, yeah. they're shittier college stadiums right now. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. The original floor of the Coliseum was highly innovative. The whole arena was a symbol of the most advanced and expensive technology of the times. Because you know what? When you're going to send a guy to get eaten by a tiger, you want to be high tech. The carbon and wood fiber slats can be tilted 90 degrees to allow light in to reveal a glimpse underneath the tunnels. Sections of it will be able to retract, sliding along runners and more fully exposing... The Warrens below the, blah, 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 blah. anyway. It'll be completed in 2023 and allow for cultural events to once take, again, take place inside the Coliseum. That'd be cool too. Yeah. How cool it would be if you were Italian and you could go see a concert at the Coliseum. Like, I don't know, maybe they do, I don't think they do any of that right now. It seems like it'd be kind of dangerous. I was a little worried about, my mom had a bad knee at the time her hobbled around that place and we didn't sign any waivers. I'm like, maybe if we push her over, we'd get a few bucks out of this vacation. <laughs> Ready for this one? Yep. See if you have the money paddles. Okay. The oldest known whiskey is soon to be up for auction. Yeah. A historic bottle of whiskey can be yours. Nice. I'm not gonna bid on this, but I'm gonna go watch it happen mm -hmm. online. If you have tens of thousand dollars to spare, the whiskey, Hold on. The whiskey bottled in LaGrange, Georgia, is about to go up for auction. Georgia? The, I know. Isn't, How weird. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I thought that was extremely strange, too. Huh. And I don't know where LaGrange, Georgia is. Go, Google that Georgia map. And I know my Georgia. I drive through Georgia a lot, and I worked in Columbus, and I worked in Atlanta a million times. The Old Ingledew whiskey oh, nice. is believed to be the oldest known whiskey in existence. Ooh. How is that even possible that it's in America? Have we ever heard of that? According to Skinner, which is facilitating the auction. The online auction is set for June 22 through 30. 
Bids are expected to fall between twenty thousand and forty thousand. Oh, it's over on the border of the border of Alabama. Border of Alabama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Arkansas is one more state over. For sure it is. And up. Yeah. Arkansas is on the border of Missouri. Yeah. That's right. It's kind of by Opelika, Alabama. Opelika, Alabama. Yep. Now here's another one. If you're getting your whiskey money out, you got 20 to 40 grand, you can have the oldest one. I just can't believe the oldest bottle of whiskey is in, I don't know, you'd think it'd be like Tennessee or, I don't know, Tennessee. Ireland. More than Georgia. Yeah. Well, a Scotch whiskey, yeah, I don't know. Very rare Irish whiskey goes up for sale at 40,000 euros a bottle, which I think is about $40,000, $5,000. Mm -hmm. Having achieved 35, thousand euros for a bottle and a very rare 45 year old whiskey Irish whiskey last year Jameson parent Jameson parent Irish distillers is now hoping to go one better with an even more expensive whiskey the asking price for the release is the Middleton very rare silent distillery collection is 40,000 euros which makes it the most expensive Irish whiskey to ever go on sale the collection is to be believed to be the state's oldest with six releases planned between 2020 and 2025 ranging from 48 to 50 years old. It's an exceptional 46 year single pot, still Irish whiskey. Created under the mature, there, there are only 70 bottles available. You want oh, it? You love red breast. I love red breast. Yeah, same thing. Same, same process. Yeah, but come on, who's same spending process. it? And then if I spent that, I wouldn't want to drink it. I just want to taste it and then- I, I would drink it. Well, then I'd have a taste and then I'd drink it. Yeah. And then by the third one, I wouldn't even know it. I could might as well just be drinking Jameson. Wouldn't even know the fucking difference. And then I'd be so sad the next day. I know where these stories end for me. <laughs> they don't end. They always end like that. Like, oh my God, did we drink it all? <laughs> Shit. I don't even remember after the third one. I was having so much fun. Did we play left, right, center? Did I lose all my ones? What's happening? Uh, oh my God, speaking of the alcohol trail. Boom, Queen Elizabeth just launched her own beer. What? Yeah, take that, <laughs> take that, Harry. Hmm? You want to sit over, over there in Montecito, whining and complaining? Well, Grandma just launched a beer. <laughs> Are you doing anything fun? No. no. Sad Cloud is upset. Yeah, Sad Cloud is upset. I thought when they went home and they, somebody wrote in the Daily Mail, uh, Harry received a cold reception when he went back for his grandma's funeral. Yeah. You call the whole family racist on global television. <laughs> Moopsie, you keep that shit at home. Bye -bye. We all know that. <sighs> the queen's moving on. She don't care about Harry's whining. Mm -hmm. And I would never defend the queen. I just think this family drama, I gotta side with the old lady. Queen Elizabeth may soon be responsible for your bar tab. Buckingham Palace has confirmed to People Magazine that the 95 year old monarch has approved the sale of a range of beer brewed from plants grown on our sundering semi-state in Norfolk. Wow. <laughs> Sold at the Sundringham gift shop for $5.50. A 500 milliliter bottle. The beers come in two varieties, a cold filtered traditional English bitter yeah. and a strong golden IPA described by the gift shop as un uniquely natural. I'd go for the IPA. Well, yeah, it's only yeah. Uh, it's only suitable that the Queen of England has a bitter beer. Yeah. Yeah. She does have a bitter beer. Yeah. And you know who's going to be holding that? Charles. Boom. <laughs> yeah. I've never even got to be king. <laughs> I'd go to that horrible boarding school where they may do exercises. Dad, I don't like to run and jump and leap. <laughs> I like to sit and read. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> This isn't the first time the queen has turned her hand to producing alcohol. Sandingham's gift shop already sells its own celebration gin, which yeah! is made in a distillery on this state. In 2020, Buckingham Palace also launched its very own gin made from ingredients found in the backyard of the queen's London home. Oh my God, she just got alcohol flowing everywhere. <laughs> I wonder if she drinks. You can't really tell on the crown if she drinks alcohol or not. I'd drink if I were her. Oh, I'd drink to the point where I wouldn't be queen anymore. I'm sure they'd be like, uh oh, somebody's gotta go get bad shit. She's she she went over the edge. Yeah, on Tuesday all of her on. given no responsibility on this earth, I would be Arthur. <laughs> to the park! To the park. I love the park. Um on Tuesday they added to this with the new release 
a new variety of gin using the classic Buckingham Palace gin mixed with hand-picked whole slow berries. Hmm. Priced at $41 a bottle, the addition of the hand-picked fruits, which grow on the blackthorn bushes of the UK, gives the gin a unique and intense fruit flavor as the release. The Trust will use the proceeds of the slow gin to help preserve the Queen's extensive art collection. Hmm. Fuck off. Oh. Well, somebody's got to protect it. It also recommends that the royal tipple. Tipple. Do you know that's a... I did not know that's a British word for drinks. My friend Jeff had some... Uh, he's got some new neighbors. They, he's from Michigan, and they asked him over for a tipple, and he didn't know what it meant. So he was like, probably, but I'm not really sure. And then we got to act like American dumb. Uh, yeah, so there you go. The queen. Is that dirty? <laughs> Should I do cameo? No. I know. No, ask him. What do you guys think? Do you know cameo? Should I do it? Ron told you to do it. Ron's doing it. He likes anything. Or he, he's like Dolly. Dolly. Like they like projects. the business projects and products and merch. and. Mm -hmm. But I guess I could give... Let's say I did it, I could give the money to, I mean, sure, I could use the money for retirement, but I also feel bad charging people for me to say happy goddamn birthday. You could give it to Paddles I could fun. give it to Paddles. Yeah, Paddles fun, yeah. I could split it with autism and cystic fibrosis, the two charities that I work for. Um, I could just buy new fishing stuff. Yeah, lures. Nah. Yeah. All right. Well, you guys let me know. Do you think, do you think it's cheesy? I don't really know enough about it either, but they email me a lot. And then I just say, it's COVID. I can't answer emails. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Bye. Oh, my God. You guys know I like art. Check this out. Okay, have you ever seen the movie Basque? Do you know who Jean-Baptiste Basque? Yep. Oh, my God. John Michael Basque. Sorry, not John Baptiste. That was the guy in the other thing, that musical. It's called. Um. Billionaires pump up Basque with 93.1 million Christie's sale. Boom. This is amazing. A painting of a skull by Jean uh, Basque uh, sold for $93.1 million at Christie's in New York on Tuesday night, becoming the artist's second most expensive work to sell at auction and setting a new benchmark for this week's blockbuster evening sales. The 1983 painting titled, we look up um, what's Basque on. We look at all panels. It's such a great movie. It's weird. Just FYI, weird as shit. Get a drink. It's weird. But you get to see his life, which was not long. Amazon. Amazon Prime, mm -hmm. you can rent it? Yep. Okay. Yep. So there you go. 1983, the painting titled In This Case was estimated to sell for more than $50 million as the lot opened a sale person populated exclusive a sales David, room. David Bowie played Andy Warhol. David Bowie played Andy Warhol in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I do remember that. And William Defoe was the electrician. William Defoe was and the electrician. Dennis Hopper. Dennis that? Hopper. Gary Oldman. Oh my God. Benicio del Toro. Benicio del Toro. I'll put that in show notes. Show notes. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it was a great. I loved it. Like I could watch it ten times because there's all kinds of super weird shit in it, and nice. the, the you miss because it's overwhelmingly. I don't think it had good commercial success, but it was great. But it's also because I'm a weirdo and I already knew who these people were, so I was like, yeah, finally somebody got to that guy's weird life. As the lot opened up to a sales room populated exclusively by cameras and auction house specialists, a senior vice president at Christie's who was leading the auction opened the bidding at forty million and quickly brought its price to fifty-two million soon. Blah 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 blah. Basque was uh, always an art market star. In the mid-80s, he was making one point million a year, even, and then that's pretty much it. But he, oh, yeah, even as he was, he ended up dying young. But uh, there you go. His estate, I don't know who got it. He didn't have any kids that I know of. Maybe his mom was happy. 93.1 million dollars. Now... Mm -hmm. Outdoor people? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know about you guys where you're at, but in the Midwest we had a cold snap. It was starting to be spring. It was starting. Everything was normal. 70, low 60, that 60, was, 70. And yeah, then it, it snapped back to cold. Not cold, cold. Not complaining, but it was weird. And as a result, guess who set the snoots alarm? 
Yeah. Did that sound like one? Not sure it didn't. Um, the Cicada Symphony is coming, but the cool weather may have put a damper on the orchestra. Maybe you've never heard it before, but it can be beautiful to some. I love it. And maddening to others. Ah, I don't know why that make you mad. And I would, if it did, you'd be really screwed because what are you going to do? Go kill seven billion of them? You can't, you can't even catch them. Scientists who studied them have waited 17 years for these noise machines to emerge from their slumber. This week's March-like weather is keeping May. In May is keeping many of the sound-producing in insects from joining their friends. On cue, this cold snap we're having in the Midwest and out east is certainly delaying the mass emergence of periodical cicadas. Etymologist Gene Kurtzke told CNN, normally we would have had cicadas emerging probably any day now. Uh, the mass emergence hasn't really kicked in yet, but he said the delay is only to be uh, expected for a few more days. Bug enthusiasts are anticipating brood X of the periodical cicadas to be the largest emergence since 2004. Billions of cicadas across 16 streets will be singing and looking for a mate covering a swath of land from Tennessee to New York. Brood X, pronounced brood 10 for the Roman numeral, is one of the, ten, one of the 15 periodical cicada broods in the U.S. Most of these periodical cicadas emerge once every 17 years, but there are a few that come out in 13-year cycles. So there you go. There you go, people. You'll know when you hear it. Mm -hmm. I told you. They should have been here by now. So, listen for your cicadas. I didn't even know they were coming this year. I didn't realize this is a 17-year deal. It's going to be larger than 2004 and better than 2004. I think they're so pretty. I love it. Yeah. It reminds me of being, I don't know, a kid, I guess. Yeah. It's just what the summer's supposed to sound like. Mustard doesn't like it. Former mom, this is such a great story. Oh my God. <laughs> Mustard's so bored. He's, oh, don't you drag your ass on my rug. <laughs> Former mob attorney. The story that never ends. Mab. 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 Mob. 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 Former mob. Mob attorney. I know, that's why I could never do the news. <laughs> Former mob attorney. Call me a lamb. Hmm. I don't know. When I'm tired, it comes out like that, too. Former mob attorney claims Jimmy Hoffa is buried under a Georgia golf course. Relax, not Augusta National. Golf Digest. This article was in a lot of places. I printed it out from Golf Digest. But when it goes, relax, not Augusta National, no one would give a shit. It would make Augusta even more alluring. Yeah. It's just them. They just, I don't know. That dog <laughs> is rolling around like it has fleas, and I know it doesn't. <laughs> Have you ever heard of French Bulldog? They make strange noises. It's like, <laughs> it's like a little, like a, more like a little pig yeah. than. Ron makes those noises. Yeah. Too. <laughs> okay. It's been 46 years since Jimmy Hoffa, the most powerful union, the most powerful union force in America, and node mob consort, has disappeared from the Red Fox restaurant. And my friend Jeff. Um, he used to, he's eaten there. It's not open anymore. But you can go, but it's not open as a restaurant anymore. I don't know if it's open as something else, but it, I don't think so. A restaurant in suburban Detroit. And and my friend Jeff was telling me that the, the Red Fox restaurant was kind of like it was a treat to get to go out. Because in the movies, they make it seem more like a, I don't know, it seemed more like a middle of the road steakhouse slash diner, but he said it for its time it was fancy. In 1982, Hoffa was declared legally dead, but that didn't stop the American Im imagination from wandering, from wandering, seeing him in every supermarket freezer section and at the bottom of a river for decades to come. Hoffa was never found, but according to former, former mob lawyer, Reginald Bubba Hopped Jr., there finally might be a break in the case. As Bubba would have you believe, Hoffa isn't sipping Mai Tais in Tahiti or sleeping with the fishes in Lake Michigan. Well, he couldn't be still alive, for God's sakes. Um, but he, this guy says he's buried beneath a golf, Georgia golf course. Um, don't worry, it's not Augusta National. Instead, Hoffa is allegedly buried beneath a green at the Savannah Inn and Golf Country Club located on Wilmington Island just off the Georgia coast. Wow. Now, what's weird is I was just there. I was just in Savannah. Shit, I could have... No, I think it's private anyway. I don't think I could have golfed there. It's a private club, but... <laughs> can I go see the body? I just want to... Yeah, can you show me where the body might be? 
But this is weird because my first thought was really, did somebody drive a body from Detroit all yeah. the way to Georgia in a trunk? Nobody's gonna wanna do that. That was my first thought. Why the hell would it be in Georgia? Well, here's the answer. The club was previously run by Chicago mobster Lou Rasanova, a former client of Bubba's. One day while playing around, Rasanova used a particular hole in the course to relieve himself. When Bubba asked him why, Rasanova let the cat out of the bag. The package was flown here from Detroit, the attorney recounts, saying that Hoffa's body was transported in a Beechcraft Air King airplane, which landed on the island's then dirt runway. They would probably locate him where no one else would ever suspect. And if you don't go around digging up golf, and you don't go around digging up golf courses, at one particular spot on the golf course, they, mobsters and teamsters, would urinate. They would laugh about it. Wow. Yeah. And when you see somebody do that, it sort of rings a bell. That's not ordinary golf etiquette. It's certainly <laughs> not, Bubba. It is certainly not. Skeptical though you may be, it's worth noting, because I, yeah, I don't know about this one. It's worth noting that the Savannah Inn and Golf Country Club was formerly run by the Teamsters Union. I didn't know that. I don't picture any of the Teamsters. Golfing. I do picture them golfing, but not, but not in the South. I picture it all St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, and then the East Coast, but not the South. Right. It's so weird. Oh, there's got to be a book on Southern Mount Teamsters. I'm, I'm going to want to know about that. <laughs> After um, uh, Formerly run by the Teamsters Union, of which Hoffa was a longtime president. After serving eight years in prison between 63 and 71, Hoffa was believed to be securing mob support for his return to the head of the union before his disappearance. Even longtime caddy master David Days Jr. acknowledges something fishy happened at the club around the time of Hoffa's disappearance. I think he might have been buried there, Days said. It happened so quick and so quietly during that time that you never can tell, but something was going on. We just couldn't put our finger on it. And there you have it, folks. Jimmy's off a grave. Jimmy Hoffa's grave has been found, and it's been used as a urinal for 45 years. Who wants to go dig that up? I don't, they're also, you know what, I'm going to go Google. How old is the Savannah Golf Club? Because I don't know any private country club that would let you dig up a green. Or really any part of the fairway. You'd have to go in the woods. Maybe they did. I don't know. But Savannah Inn and Country Club. I just, that doesn't sound right. I don't necessarily believe that one. Um, I'm looking. Hmm? I'm looking. 1794. 1794? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Holy shit. It's the oldest golf club in the country. It's the oldest in the country? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I've never heard of it. How come nobody plays anything yeah. there? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe they do. 1920s, a wealthy cotton broker. 1920s. Wait, hang on. Never mind. Wrong Savannah. This Savannah. Wrong Savannah, thank you. Yeah. I'm like, 1794, <laughs> we were already golfing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, 1920. 1920. Mm -hmm. Still, that golf course would have been secured for 50 years. I can't see anyone allowing anyone for any reason. We'll put it in the show notes. It's too expensive. Yeah. All right, speaking of golf, I don't know if I should applaud these people. Can you hear the dog? <laughs> Mustard, come here. <laughs> it's one hour. Just relax. <laughs> I know I don't like, this is not a sports announcement. This is a, <laughs> he's behind the, he's behind the people. He likes people. to Tucker because she's from Texas. <laughs> there you go. All right. Pine Valley, number one golf course in the United States. Here's what's weird. I have golf just about everywhere. I never even heard of this place. It's in New Jersey. I'll, to allow female members for the first time in its 100 plus history. There are still people doing this shit? Really? And apparently they're not the last. <sighs> Pine Valley, an exclusive men's only golf club in Southern New Jersey, home to the number one ranked golf course in the United States, voted to allow female members in unrestricted women's play for the first time in its 108 years. You know, this kind of horse shit. Oh, we don't want women members. And then here was the, even a, a bigger one at a country club in St. Louis, I will not say the name of, but they, they said that people under 14 couldn't play at certain times because of the, these are the rules. In other words, you're just a kid. And at 13, my brother could have kicked at least, at least half of those old men's asses, mm -hmm. at least. 
It should be by your handicap. If you're going to start penalizing people with shitty tea times, mm -hmm. you say, you suck, and you guys, well, you play slowly if you suck, and that's okay, mm -hmm. but then you guys get these tea times. You don't get, we don't put them in the middle of fast people. There's a way to organize all this, and it has nothing to do with men or women, because you're going to say Annika Sorensen couldn't go out there and beat everyone at this club? I bet she could, and I bet she could beat every member for this club at the men's tees. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I can't believe it's 2021, and we're still doing it. The news was announced to all members in an email letter, emailed letter. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sure there were a lot of guys that opened their email and went, what the fuck? <laughs> what do you mean chicks are going to be there? Totally. That's where I go. Take away from the chicks. This evening, at our annual meeting of the members, we made a historic change to Pine Valley's bylaws, wrote Club President Jim Davis. The future of golf is much moved towards inclusion, and I'm pleased to report that the trustees and the members of Pine Valley Golf Club have voted unanimously with enthusiasm to remove all gender-specific language from our... Um, watch them remove all the language and then just not vote the ladies in. <laughs> we took the words out. What do you guys want? Um... The club's policy will now allow all guests to enjoy our club without restriction. We begin immediately identifying women candidates for membership. Well, I would ask, but I ain't anywhere in New Jersey. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I could ask on Lewis Black's behalf. He probably shoots what a lot of the women do. Probably. Not in a bad way. Right, from the women's tees. No, he'd be at the senior men's tees. <laughs> uh, the change follows lifting the historic gender issue at other men's clubs. Augusta National Golf Club, host of the Masters, accepted women, women members for the first time in 2011. Jesus, you are a decade behind Augusta. Yeah. Sit with yourselves, Pine Valley. <laughs> you put yourself in a corner and give yourself a little time out. The Royal, Ancient, Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews, holder of the Open Shift, voted to allow members in 2014. God, even Scotland, even St. Andrews did it in 2014. First time in their 260-year history in Muirfields in Scotland, home of the... I cannot imagine. I can't imagine it. Obviously, it's happening to walk up and say, I know these aren't public, but, well, St. Andrews, you can get a tea time. Normal yeah. people can. Yeah. I mean, you have to do it a year in advance, but you can't. And then to say, what, well, we don't let, I'm sorry, you can't play, you're a woman. Who still has the, the, the audacity to say that out loud? I just don't. <sighs> All four golf clubs are considered private. No. No, it's not. Not St. Andrews. No. But what separates Pine Valley is that it doesn't hold major champions or opens of any kind. Out of 3,670 private golf clubs in the U.S., fewer than a dozen remain men's only. I'm going to find out their names, and I'm going to publicly sh shame them. I don't, not that I could belong to any of them. I'm sure they're way out of my price range, but there might be some lady that don't, wants to. Women guests, guests at Pine Valley were previously allowed to play the course only on Sunday afternoons. The most noticeable immediate change will be the presence of women on the course at any time. So I'm even surprised they gave them Sunday afternoons. Okay, so it's June 1st. We're going to announce all the tickets will be on sale, and we added cities, and I haven't even said them. They're coming in, coming in hot. Let's put it that way. There was one. There's so many I'm excited about, but I can't say them yet because they're not on sale, and then... The, the venue. Well, I can say the Mirage. Yeah. That's August 6th. That one's so fun. I get so excited to go. Like, almost like a child excited. The Ryman. Um, the Ryman in Nashville is super duper exciting. The, the Mother Church of Country Music. And I don't really know that much about country. I did the Grand Ole Opry once. That's not at the Ryman anymore. That's out at the Grand Ole Opry. And like, I know I was in famous people's dressing rooms, but I'm like, who's little Jimmy Pickens? Who's Jimmy Dickens? Dickens. <laughs> Jimmy, little Jimmy Dickens? Dickens. I don't know. Uh, John Panette was still alive then, and me and John were just ha having fun, having fun with not knowing what anything. we were, not anything. We didn't know shit. I knew Minnie Pearl. I'm like, right. well, I know Minnie Pearl, and I know Vince Gill because I do benefits with him here and there by accident, and he's very nice. But, yeah. Uh I'll take some pictures from backstage at the Ryman. I don't even know if I'm allowed to. It's all very, very yeah, safe. you can. Can I? Yeah. Okay. I yeah. can take pictures. I don't think you can take video. They don't like filming. 
No. Um, so, but anyway, on June 1st, look for all that to activate. And if the ticket links don't work right out of the gate, give it a minute. Sometimes that stuff can go a little, what I like to call, monkey weird. <laughs> monkey weird. Well, it's nobody's fault. There's just there's a lot of moving parts to doing all that stuff. And thank God I don't have to do any of them because it would never get done. I, I, you would have to come to my house to buy tickets for whatever show. Oh, you want Tanya Tucker? I have two tickets. Hold on. Do you have cash? I couldn't, the links and all that crap. But anyway, we've added a bunch. And then the 2022 dates, the ones that I have anyway, those will be on there too. Uh, some of them will go so far out. I don't know if they'll be on sale, but like, mm -hmm. they said, can you do A and B November 4th and 5th of 2022? And I go, wow, I guess. I haven't even lived the, the November we haven't lived yet. <laughs> and you guys are going into a future November. Mm -hmm. And then I want to go, I don't know if I can commit to that. <laughs> I might hate comedy by then. Might have to go to a baby shower or something. <laughs> All right, termites. It's been fun as always. You're good termites. You're worthy termites. We're going to put mustard in the video. Oh, we'll put mustard in. Here. Yeah. Mustard, come here. come here. Mustard. You guys can see him. Come, come here. Come here. Here, want a cracker? He can't have a cracker. Come here. Come here. Come here. No, I already gave him treats and shit. Ron's gonna kill me. Yeah, Ron's, go give him the Ron's gonna kill me. Hi. Say hi to the people. That's a microphone. He's cute, right? Yeah, he's adorable. He, and he's a real snuggler. He yeah. really likes to lounge. Yeah. We won't tell Ron you were in that. <laughs> Ron won't watch it. He don't care about his shit. I'll say hi to the people. Make it pick. <laughs> well, okay, all right. You went down. Usually you'll hang out with me. You don't like this. I don't either. Okay, go. He wants my beer. All right. All right. Oh, boom. That's it, termites. Have a good week. Night-night, termites. <laughs>